What's going on, beautiful people? Kira Savvy here. Savvy Kira on Instagram and Facebook. Self-help podcaster and vlogger of Literally Just Talk Radio. So I just closed out season one. And I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you. If you've been listening, if you've been watching me thus far, you know that this has been an incredible journey. You've decided to take a moment in listening to the show and in even viewing the talk series, Talk Heavy TV, to connect to yourself, to connect to different thought processes and ideas. So as I'm closing out season one, I'm thinking about season two. I'm thinking about how we can gain a closer connection to one another, how we can continue to connect to thought processes and ideas that we need for us to stay connected to one another. And so with that being said, I'm excited to announce that season two of Literally Just Talk Radio, Talk Heavy TV, in collaboration with Mind of the Storm Studios, will be going live this spring, every first and last Saturday. So I'm gonna be introducing some new guests, having some new interviews, even talking to some people from the past. And if you've been on the show before, hit me up. Let me know that you wanna come back. I really love to speak with you and put you in front of a live audience. Make sure you send me an email, savvykara at literallyjusttalk.com. Now that's not to say that you can't view or listen to past episodes. You can find me at Savvy Kira on Instagram and Facebook to get the latest for season two and also view past episodes and listen to past episodes of Literally Just Talk Radio at www.ljtrtalkheavy.com. Till next time, I'll see you in season two. Peace. <laughs> Together, no one suffers alone. Together, no one suffers alone. We can show people it's not just, it's, it's really not just one of us. We are all got to come together in this. Together, nobody suffers alone. matters exposing the secrets as always like thank mine the storm for allowing us to use this platform um, I'm really excited for this evening's episode uh, person that a special guest we have tonight has got a lot of knowledge to share in regards to the intersectionality between domestic violence uh, concussions and traumatic brain injuries um, I was very enlightened after a conversation with him and I think that you will be too uh, before we get started though let's go over some ground rules if there is any insensitive, if there is anything uh, put on that screen, comes on the comments, you will be uh, ejected from the podcast for good. Um, if there is, um, if you are triggered in any way, shape, or form, please disconnect immediately and go self-care. It's so important that you take the time for yourself. Um, it's okay. We'll be here again. And, you know, you can always reach out to me uh, through uh, our platforms. Um, um, our email is obm one at gmail.com. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our special guest is Dr. Vincent Schaller, founder of MAC Physicians, Mid-Atlantic Concussion Physicians. Um, so with that, um, welcome Dr. Schaller. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I, I appreciate you putting the time aside for us. Um, so I guess, uh, do you want to give us a little bit about yourself, a little small biography? Tell us how we uh, ended up, how Dr. Schaller went from um, being an ER doctor and how he ended up working in the domestic violence community in regards to this uh, subject matter. No, absolutely. So I started off, uh, my background and training is in uh, family practice and spent most of my early career in hospital work, ER, and urgent care work. I definitely saw my share of domestic violence uh, injuries in the, uh, in the hospital environment, in ER, and urgent care. Uh, I did have my own urgent care center uh, from 2003 to 2013, and in that window of time, uh, really saw a lot of head injuries, uh, 
of all sorts, including domestic violence, sports injuries, car accidents, work injuries. And uh, it was an interesting situation that these patients were coming in, they'd have a head injury on the first visit, uh, possibly some soft tissue injuries that they were experiencing with um, you know, uh, bruises, broken ribs, fractures coming from uh, falls, unfortunately also in the case of domestic violence. And I started realizing these patients were coming back like a week or two later having ongoing symptoms, headaches, dizziness, nausea. Uh, unfortunately, these patients then um, kept coming back because when you have a traumatic brain injury, you bruise the brain. Uh, unlike what you see on television with professional sports, they get knocked out, they're throwing up, they're back in two weeks, you know, or less. The, that's not what really happens in the real world when you're following these patients. So my patients would be coming back with head injuries a week later with a headache, two to three weeks later with a headache, and the urgent care like the ER is open every day. So on a Saturday, they're gonna come back and say, hey, this headache's not going away. So for all those years of practice, uh, I found that, you know, I try to get them in with a neurology uh, peer, neurology friend. And the biggest problem I ran into is these people with head injuries were either out of work, out of school, or not playing their sport for one, two, three, four weeks, and they were still very symptomatic. And so I would call my neurology friends and say, hey, I got a case I really need you to see. They've been out of work for a month. Could you please uh, see them soon? And the unfortunate part was is that my neurology peers were booking out three months. And you know it, it, these patients would have to wait another three months to see somebody to take care of their head injury. So I realized it was a really uh, kind of, there's a big gap uh, from injury to seeing a specialist for the came to brain injury. I couldn't fault my neurology friends because you know there's a lot of new developments in Alzheimer's and ALS, seizures and MS, a lot of new treatments and medications. So they're trying to keep up with that volume. And I'm sitting here in an urgent care center with a growing population of head injury people that are having you know day-to-day -day symptoms that are preventing them from studying in school, college or high school, going back to work, can't tolerate two computer screens in the professional world. And uh, it realized that there's a big problem here that there's a bunch of folks that need to be seen within a week or two, not within two or three months. So what ended up happening, it's kind of interesting, I fell into the, the whole uh, solution to this problem. Uh, somewhere around 2005, uh, 2006, uh, patients started coming into my practice in urgent care saying, uh, hey, Dr. Schaller, can you do that post-injury uh, impact test? Uh, I had it done in, in high school or college uh, you know, with a baseline. Could you please go ahead and uh, do my post-injury test? I just had an injury on my football game on Friday or just had an injury on my you know, wrestling match. And so one patient came in, and in a matter of a few months, about a dozen patients came in from both sides of the PA Delaware border. We, my office was in Hocus in Delaware. And I realized that there was a growing need for us to understand this technology. And I was relieved because that was the first technology I'd heard of since uh, practice training residency that there's something new that we can do to assess a concussion. Uh, so that led me out to uh, tra take a trip out to uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, met with the professors, uh, Dr. Mickey Collins and Dr. Mark Lowell, who actually invented the impact program. And I found out that it wasn't just an impact program that we could use to assess people after concussions, but that Dr. Lowell and Dr. Uh, Collins had put together a very comprehensive program for diagnosing, then treating and following a concussion from start to finish. And it included training us on how to use medications for post-injury, uh, head injury, uh, concussion patients, taught us how to do a quick five-minute VOMS exam to uh, assess somebody very quickly, either on the field or in the urgent care or ER environment. And they taught us how to use therapies, vestibular therapy, ocular therapy. And what's most important was, is back then, we didn't have all the fancy technology we have today. We actually would do a VOMS exam, which is a five-minute uh, eye tracking exam. Uh, and every visit they get a VOMS exam, every visit they get an impact test, and we could actually watch the recovery on a trajectory going up and up and up to improvement. So the way I got involved was I said to the folks in the Pittsburgh, I said, hey, listen, we've got a lot of patients that are waiting three months. Could I help these patients? And they wouldn't have to wait the three months. And they said, they shouldn't be waiting three months. Uh, ideally, with a traumatic brain injury, you should be seen within a week. You should start therapy within a week or two. And I realized that that was not happening in my area of Hocus and Delaware or southeastern Pennsylvania. So they said that back when I uh, trained with the folks out there, it was a in-person training and in-person lectures, and I rounded them in their, in their center. And the deal was I had to see 50 patients back in the Hocassin, start to finish, and then I took two oral exams to certify not only as a certified impact consultant with their group, but also to be a uh, certified trainer. So I've been, for the last, uh, since about 2008, when I fully certified, I've been training uh, 
hundreds of doctors, uh, nurse practitioners, PAs, hundreds of physical therapists, occupational therapists. So doing lectures for the last over 10 years and uh, really built uh, a network of uh, uh, medical practices of 65 groups in the six states right now that actually work together, share data, share the database. And we've been growing. Our, my, my biggest mission was, is after we started seeing a lot of patients, was to train more providers so we could handle the bandwidth, get everybody in within a week's time and follow them start to finish. And we've been very lucky. Uh, new technologies have just been absolutely blossoming in the last five years or so. And, and we've been doing this for we did this for 14 years. In the last five years, we picked up uh, all kinds of new technologies. I was going to say, you had mentioned to me that the um, the difference in like the three medical studies um, over the, the decades and the difference in what they have found um, and how concussions are more able to be treated today, whereas before, I don't know if you want to explain a little bit of that to just give the audience a little bit of knowledge about the fact that some of, there are treatments out there, whereas before we were made to believe this is what you have, it's, you're either, it's, you know what I mean, you're going to heal it or you're not. Absolutely. What we found was, uh, just to give you an example on a case of domestic violence, so when I finally trained and, and was very comfortable doing these ex assessments and exams, uh, a patient came in that unfortunately um, was a, a victim of her husband. Uh, he had actually, it was a, multiple episodes, unfortunately, of abuse. The particular episode that I was involved in, um, her husband came crashing through the door, grabbed her by the neck, pushed her up onto the wall, literally off of her, uh, off the floor, God forbid, left all these marks on her neck uh, and, and neck injury. And I did what I did all my career, evaluated the soft tissue injury, checked the neck, x-rayed the neck, worked it all up. And I, I'll never forget this. I went back to my desk and I said, wait a minute, she was jarred up against the wall she wasn't complaining of any head eggs. I said, but this sounds like she could have had a concussion with the acceleration, deceleration force of her husband pushing her up against the wall and slamming her into the wall. I went back and I did a VOMS exam and I was kind of embarrassed because I had been doing VOMS exams for five years at that point and I would have, should have naturally thought about checking for a concussion. I'm writing all her notes up and finishing her x-rays, explaining everything to her and I stopped in my tracks and I said, ma'am, could I check you out for a concussion? And she said, absolutely, doc. So I went in and did a VOMS exam. She was doubling vision at two feet away, which is completely abnormal. It should be doubling vision at three inches away from your from your vision. She had uh, eyes uh, wiggling all over the place called nystagmic eye activity. When I was done, I realized this lady had a very severe concussion. She was actually an executive at a local bank and she ended up being out of work for almost three months. She went through aggressive ocular and vestibular therapy uh, multiple medication managements, uh, very close follow-up, very rigorous course. She developed severe migraines. She developed anxiety, depression, all of these spinning off of her TBI. And it really shocked me. And when I look backwards, when she was all recovered and we signed off on her, if I didn't go back to do that VOMS exam, that five-minute VOMS exam, she would have gone right by me and I would have completely missed the whole point of head injury. And when she went back to work, she would have realized she's struggling with head eggs with computer screens and all when she went back to her job. But we were able to intercept, diagnose, keep her out of work, and start aggressive uh, therapy for her. And she made a wonderful recovery. She did have wonderful support of her family. She had two little children uh, and uh, was able to then utilize the social service resources for herself. Uh, ended up then moving off on her own. She could have been very independent. She was ended up becoming a, a single mom. Uh, but uh, she was an excellent success case, not only with how she escaped the unfortunate uh, situation of uh, domestic violence with her children and had good supportive friends and family, but she also kept her job uh, and she fully recovered from the concussion. And you have to remember like the neck injury, the soft tissue injury, that usually resolves unless there's a herniated disc, that resolves within weeks. And you can forget all about the whole injury, but the traumatic brain injury doesn't. And in some cases it can lead permanent deficits. In her case, she controlled her migraines beautifully. She was back to work. I got to see her on the last visit. Everything was back to normal. She was in a safe place, had really settled a lot of issues that she was struggling with. And it was just so refreshing to see a case like that. But I guess the point to take home is, is that I realized that us docs in the urgent cares, ERs, and in primary care, we got to be on alert for a concussion because domestic violence is already kind of invisible. Domestic violence, unfortunately, is something that people they make excuses how they were injured. I can't tell you how many cases over 25 years of practicing medicine, someone said, I, I fell. Uh, someone said, you know, I slept. 
uh, and you're examining them, and it's hard to differentiate the suspicion of domestic violence. We get lots of training on it, but it's still very invisible. It's, and if, if the, the, the victim does not want to admit the story, heck, I've even had a patient that was a concussion patient of mine, and she was in a car accident, legitimately in a car accident, had a concussion. She came in like three months into her therapy and treatment, and she said, uh, I just fell. And she knew me. I had been caring for her for three months. She didn't say that it was domestic violence until her concussions got so much more complicated with the, with the injury. She said, Dr. Shah, I have to admit this, my, my husband hit me and uh, it was not falling. And I was shocked because she had already known me for three months. I'd already cared for her. We built a relationship, a, a, a patient relationship. And I thought to myself, if, if she was walking into an urgent care ER, she would never share that. It took her three months to share it with me. So I was really, I'm just amazed how it's it's hidden. Domestic violence is hidden. There's an embarrassment. They don't want to report it. There's a hesitation if, if they're afraid of financial retribution or, you know, some sort of re physical retaliation. And so it's just really, for, I've seen this for 25 years. And I was just shocked at how many cases of domestic violence end up with a head injury. I would have never, even with all my training and concussions and all my training in ER and urgent care, uh, I was humbled that the, the, Every, every time I see an injury of the neck, head, domestic violence, work injury, I'm checking for a concussion because uh, it's just that it's, it's that invisible even to the medical providers. So we really have to be not only on guard and watching carefully for a concussion injury, we have to be on guard and watching carefully and asking the right questions to, to let the patient have confidence to share with us that they had their, their injuries were not from a fall. They were from domestic violence. And that takes a, it takes a lot of experience and a lot of talent and we got to learn better how to op let people feel comfortable enough to open up to us what's really going on so we can help them well unfortunately you know and you're you're absolutely correct and unfortunately in the dynamics of domestic violence um most frequently and that's why it was so i'm so honored to have you on here because i respect you as a physician i have heard your story and i know why you left the er field and i think it's pretty commendable um i know as a victim as well as an owner of a domestic violence organization and having a grassroots for domestic violence and fighting this cause, I am very grateful to have a doctor who, who, is, who includes, is, is able to one, be accountable for the fact of his own downfalls, right? And that you, you, but you, made, you made a difference and you turned things around into a way that it's inclusive, we're inclusive of that. And honestly, this is probably one of the first times I really felt like that as a victim at all. Um, so I really appreciate you. Um, and just uh, for the audience to know, you know, Dr. Schaller and I met through uh, a new platform that's out there, and it was an article um, that was sent to me that his daughter wrote um, in regards to domestic violence. And it was so heart touching. And honestly, it was in October of this past October. And um, we can share that, Dr. Schaller, if you want to, um, if you have a link for the article, you want to put that in the chat, um, feel free to do that. Absolutely. Um, I've also, uh, through our conversations, well, we discussed the misconceptions, but um, you had said that sometimes uh, we suffer, the, some people who end up, we know why people end up a lot of times in domestic violence, and it occurs from previous situations and experiences, right? So you had explained to me that there's times when people are living their entire life with TBI from child abuse or just being smacked in the back of the head as a child even. and. Mm -hmm as they grow older into more abusive relationships, it just gets re-traumatized. Is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, the effect of concussions can be quite cumulative. The, 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 most, the most significant, we'll probably say the most significant problem is if you have a concussion at any, let's, say, let's we'll, we'll take your, I like your example, a childhood, maybe got abused as a child, and then later in life have maybe concussions in sports, in high school and college. The, big th the biggest concern we have in the concussion community is that if you have an injury as a child, fell out of the crib, fell down the stairs, you know, then you go to play little league, you know, uh, football, or, you know, then you go play soccer and you get a concussion there. The problem is, is that each and every concussion needs to be diagnosed and treated to full recovery. If that's not the case, whether you're a child, a young athlete, an adult, or a work injury or a car accident, then unfortunately the deficits that we can detect will linger for months, if not years. 
So if you have visual deficits from a concussion from a child, then you go play in high school sports, get another concussion, also undiagnosed, untreated, it just becomes cumulative. And the sad part is, is that I've got patients that'll, actually I've got, we'll say attendees of lectures. I remember one lecture I did was for about 450 school nurses uh, in, in Philadelphia, a public school system. And after the lecture was done and I talked to these school nurses about how to do a violence exam, you know, how to take an impact test and diagnose a concussion, I had four nurses come up to me after the lecture and said, can you test me with the VOMS? And I, I literally did. I did the VOMS exam standing at the, on the, the platform of the stage and did uh, about four VOMS exams on four separate nurses. And I was finding abnormalities from their injuries that were years ago. And it, you see this all the time in a concussion environment. They don't resolve themselves. The biggest thing that I found was, 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 not, was, was a, false, a, a falsity of training and residency and all is I was trained as a medical student and a resident. Give it time, it'll heal itself. My goodness, that's the worst advice I've ever been given. And we have learned so much in the last 25 years since I came out of education and residency. We learned a lot. It doesn't fix itself. <laughs> I've got um, folks coming out of the, uh, veterans coming out of the Iraq-Afghan war that were involved in an, an ID explosion. One guy had one eight years ago and one five years ago. His VOMS exam was grossly abnormal. A simple little five minute VOMS exam with fingers and eyes, and he was doubling vision at two feet. And this was years later. No, no one diagnosed him. He had two ID explosions. Nobody diagnosed either concussion. Nobody treated either concussion. He got a complete bill of clean health as he left the military. And he realized he was having problems because he was an HVAC technician. And he, because he was doubling his vision at two feet away, he literally had to hold his tools two feet away from his head and vision to do his job. And he came to me and said, I'm having all these problems with my tools and with fine motor skills. And when I took a target and brought it in nice and slow, I usually bring out a good old tongue depressor, nothing fancy, nothing expensive, dot on the tongue depressor, and I brought it in. And as I'm bringing it in, he saw the dot go double two feet away. This is something that happened oh, at least six years previously. Did it fix itself? Absolutely not. But the wonderful thing with concussion recovery is there's no expiration date. We put him in aggressive ocular therapy, proper prescription medications to help his brain go through the rehabilitation. And that two feet became one foot, became six inches. By the time he was recovered, it took about six months. He was back to being able to do his job totally, totally well. And again, it did all the way back to two IED explosions, probably neither diagnosed or treated in his military service. And uh, I felt like, wow, what a, what a find. I was really glad that he reached out to us and asked for help. Yeah, you know, um, I wanted to ask you specifically because it, in our conversation we had on the phone, um, I had expressed some different uh, problems I was going through health-wise. One was my vision and uh, one was uh, my memory, really bad. And I told you a little bit about my story and you know, that I was thrown head first and conscious several times, um, amongst many other things. And I told you, like, I, I just stopped going back to the doctors because it's just, they continually just new glasses every two, three weeks. I'm, you know, and you really gave me a ton of hope by sharing that, that what I've gotten so far is in fact, like, really good treatment, basically. Um, and I find it, like, interesting. Um, so how long, is, is there a, a deadline on traumatic, like, obviously the traumatic brain injury, I do know a few people that are diagnosed with that um, from all different levels of that scale. Um, how long, is there a deadline? Is there a point where you can no longer, like, help or change any of that? So the good news, a great question, and the good news is there is no deadline. There's no expiration date. Uh, we have patients, like I said, that could be six, seven, eight years later, and we sit down and start like we, like they had been concussed the week before. Um, the good news is that with the brain, if you look at the numbers, the, uh, look at the brain, you want to think numbers, okay? The brain and the spinal cord have over 80 billion nerves. 80 billion, not million, 80 billion nerves, okay? So what happens is that the, the mechanism, looking at numbers and mechanism, so if the brain is my hands, and it's soft like pizza dough, 
no matter the brain doesn't have to be that the skull doesn't have to be lacerated the face doesn't have to be bruised or or, or black eyes okay all you need is an acceleration deceleration force whether it's being slammed against the wall in a car accident rear-ended from behind at 50 miles an hour it's that sudden stopping of the hard skull and a soft brain tissue smacking into the hard skull and bruising itself and sometimes the force is so great the acceleration deceleration is so quick that not only does it slam into a hard bone, but it actually breaks nerve fibers. And when you break nerve fibers, that's permanent, that's structural. But here's the good news. You got 80 billion nerves. The brain only uses 15, about, about 10 to 15% of those 80 billion nerves. That leaves a lot of nerves that are just hanging out, could be recruited, but they're kind of like reserves, reserve nerves, like the reserves in the military. They could be, you know, sit and wait and be called to duty. Now, when you break those nerve fibers, the good news is that you've got those extra of the 80 billion nerves running parallel to the broken ones, and you need to recruit those nerves to take over the function of the broken nerve. Now, when I was in residency, I was told if you, if you have a, just like muscle retraining, absolutely. I was told in medical school, if you have a stroke, you better get moving because you only have three months to recover the brain after a stroke. They, they beat that into us, you have three months. If you don't do therapy in those three months, all bets are off, you're done. That was based on the fact that a nerve grows back one millimeter a day. So it takes three months for a nerve that's cut to grow back from the cell body all the way through a millimeter a day takes three months, okay? We realize that we don't need that nerve to grow back in, in a concussion. We bruised nerves, broken some nerves. We need to recruit the healthy nerves to come back. And that is why we're seeing such amazing success with, with ocular therapy, vestibular therapy, I mean, we really are seeing incredible amounts of recovery uh, that we would have never expected uh, when I was a resident. And uh, what's really neat is that when I met the folks out at Pittsburgh, uh, Dr. Collins said to me, he goes, uh, Dr. Shower, he goes, your biggest challenge is gonna be finding good ocular therapists back in Delaware and Pennsylvania. And he was right. I mean, I only found one in Delaware, found two in Pennsylvania. Uh, and to this date, 14 years later of the Mac Alliance, the Mid-Atlantic Concussion Alliance, we have a network of over 60 ocular therapists in the tri-state, actually in the six states we work in. And, uh, but this, these, these technologies are evolving. They're evolving quickly. And fortunately, people are starting to learn these skills and we're starting to have more places to send our, our patients. But if, I, if a patient came to me back in 2008 and I had to find an ocular therapist, it would take me weeks or months to find one, okay? And vestibular therapy was not easily available. I had to find, there could be 30 PT centers in my area, maybe only two or three had a vestibular therapist. Uh, so, but I can happily say 14 years later, many, many lectures later, uh, in large groups with uh, Novacare and ATI and, and uh, Phoenix Physical Therapy and uh, Pivot PT, all these groups, uh, they have now trained all their people to do vestibular work for concussions. And that's a big change in just uh, 10 years, big change. I'm really proud of these professionals because now I can just go, who's in your backyard? Novacare, ATI, Pivot, Phoenix. You've got a vestibular therapist within a few miles of your house. You're gonna go there three times a week and you're gonna start your vestibular rehab immediately. So Dr. Schaller, we have just a very few couple minutes left. Um, I don't want to cut you short, and I definitely want to have you back on. Um, but I want to ask uh, just really quick: Could you list some of the health conditions that people should consider if they've had any type of brain injury or been shoved hard enough um, before we uh, have to close things out? Sure. So the, the health conditions that result after the concussion? Yeah, like me never. Like I'm two and a half or going on three years out of my domestic violence and having memory it's just like really bad starting and the problem with my vision. So what type, I would, I never connected them. So what type of other health conditions can people like maybe consider maybe reaching out to a concussion specialist? Absolutely. So where are the health conditions, uh, which is very common, unfortunately is anxiety and depression. A study uh, just from last summer of 2021 showed that even in young athletes, over 37% of the concussion patients will develop anxiety and depression post-concussion, a drop in neurotransmitters that will require medical care. Another problem is migraines, severe migraines. If you had a car accident, and, uh, unfortunately the victim of domestic violence, and all of a sudden you're having really bad headaches, daily headaches, that's another long-term problem that you would wanna see a doctor say, hey, maybe I had a concussion. Uh, the other thing is light and sound sensitivity. Ongoing for weeks or months, 
most likely from your concussion if you had a recent injury. And then also you're going to find problems with uh, vision. You have a hard time at work in front of the computer screen. You're struggling in the classroom. You can't remember what was on page one when you get to page two or three because your eyes are jumping all over the page. So visual problems, problems with academics. All of a sudden your student is getting horrible scores and grades in school and you're looking for answers. It could have been a concussion. Get them checked out. Uh, and somebody who's struggling at work, they normally work in front of two computer screens, and now they're really just, they can't get through two hours without a he massive headache. Think about getting checked up for a concussion. And then um, in addition to all that is the memory thing. You mentioned that initially. The memory problems, uh, there's problems with remembering names, problems with remembering words. It's called word block or aphasia. Uh, we have a really good blog on that on our site. We're literally are having a conversation, you hit a word, and you can't remember the word you hit. And if you almost think about it, the computer is like a hard drive. Uh, I always tell my patients to be kind of make it simple. You got a hard drive on the front of your brain, frontal temporal lobe. You got a processor motherboard on the back of your brain. And when you get bruised on your hard drive, it doesn't, you can't access the, the data on that hard drive, just like a bad hard drive on your computer. And you literally are having a sentence and grabbing words off the hard drive but, and, and synthesizing. And all of a sudden, uh, you can't get that word. And those patients struggle. They, they stutter, they, they, they feel they're stupid, and they avoid uh, social conversations and interactions and it becomes very isolating. And so there's a lot of memory and processing issues. People will tell me, I used to be the multitasker in the neighborhood. I organized everything. After my head injury, I can't even do three three step projects. I can't even get through a recipe with five steps because I get lost. And so these are very common and unfortunate um, long-term issues with concussions. Okay, so Dr. Schaller, um, I appreciate you being on the show tonight. I am so honored to be working with you and um, future projects that we will be doing together. So please, everybody, stay tuned. Um, again, you can go on to macconcussion.com and uh, all the information that he's discussed, um, some of the articles, his uh, social media links are, are all in there. Um, the other thing is, don't think because, I just want to end with this, um, don't think because that you can't afford it. Um, one thing we did discuss, um, and maybe we can have another show in regards to this, but Dr. Schaller is also um, passionate to the point where he works to help victims be able to do these treatments um, because they're necessary to live a quality life. So Dr. Schaller, with that, um, do you have any lasting words? Yes, you made a very good point. When it comes to patients who are thinking, I can't even go get checked out by a physician or a health center because I don't have insurance. Um, when our patients come to us day one, if they don't have insurance, we're going to help get them access and resources to state assistance insurance like Medicaid. We even work really hard for patients who have long-term uh, traumatic brain injury problems who can't work. We help them get social security disability and Medicare. Uh, they might be in a legal situation. They don't know that they could reach out and make sure that the workers' comp's taking good care of them, uh, make sure that the car insurance company is, is, is getting them whole back to normal again. So we work with a lot of different resources. We try to put our patients in touch. The last thing I ever want to do in, in any medical practice I've done for 25 years is say, I can't treat you because you don't have the money. That's never been my motto. My answer is, let's find how to get this financed. Let's find the resources that you need and deserve to make sure that you get good care, good medical care. So Dr. Schaller, with that, can I ask you to stay together? No one suffers alone. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and this is a, it really takes a lot of resources to help folks with traumatic brain injury. My, my, but the thing I hear all the time from my patients and I see on social media, it's a, it's a invisible disease. It's invisible. Right. You look good, you sound good. Why aren't you working? Okay, I, I get people all the time that go, my father-in-law is saying, I'm a bum. I'm not back to work yet. What's going on with you? It's invisible. And, and sometimes they start doubting themselves. They don't think they have a head injury. They think they must be making it up. They must be anxious. They must be depressed. But the, the sad part is, is that, um, you know, it's real. And once I showed them the objective data from their tests that they have, they're struggling with these, you can visibly see their eyes moving all over the place. You see a relief in their face that, oh my God, I, I really do have a head injury. I, I'm not making it up. My, my father-in-law is not correct. I'm not a bum, you know? And, and it feels really good when they make that, that light bulb goes off in the exam room. And I'm like, yeah, you're not. And it has been months, it has been years. They go, but, but the football player is back in a week. And I'm like, you have to ignore professional sports. That's a whole different environment. They don't want the technology. I said, you have to put that aside. This, this is your injury. Your injury is unique to you. And it could take weeks, months, or years 
we can't, we have to, we just have to treat you and get on this journey together and work on recovery. And I don't have a crystal ball. It could be weeks, it could be months, it could be years. But what I will promise my patient, we won't give up on you. Not going to give up on you. As long as it takes, we're going to, we're going to work with you. And that's why we have you on here. And Dr. Saller, uh, we are definitely going to have you back on because you are just full of so much information and knowledge. And I think that this is a topic that we definitely need to, ex- uh, you know, extend. My and, uh, pleasure. Go a little deeper. And so with that, I really appreciate you taking the time for, uh, for me and the audience and the platform um, and your knowledge. And I can't wait to talk to you again soon. Thank you for your time. You're welcome, ma'am. You have a good night. Take care, Don. You too. And together, no one suffers alone.